Hello, everybody out there uh, in CPAC land, uh, on social media, on our website at conservative.org. Uh, we're excited to bring you another great episode of CPAC Live. Today, we have a great show. Actually, every day we have a great show. But today, we're, uh, we're really pleased with the guests we're bringing to you to have a conversation about what the nation has faced with uh, Chinese corona and uh, all the different aspects and permutations it takes uh, in our lives. Today, we are going to be joined by Deputy Secretary of HHS, Eric Hargan, who's going to give you an, uh, a current view of what the administration's doing to keep us all safe and also to get this economy uh, opened up as much as it possibly can be opened up. Because as we know, America isn't really America if America isn't back to work. And uh, we're also going to be joined by Vince Colonnese. And I don't want Secretary Hargan uh, to be worried, but uh, Vince is going to listen to the conversation I have with uh, Secretary Hargan, and you know he's going to have his own commentary on what the Trump administration is doing. Uh, I listen to Vince every morning uh, here in the swamp on WMAL's Morning in America, and I or Mornings on the Mall, and I also uh, know the great job he does at the Daily Caller, and I think you're going to like what he has to say as well. And of course, we're going to have a special guest. Uh, which I'm not going to tell you who it is, but you will find out in a mere 29 minutes or so. So uh, now it's my honor to bring to you the Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services, Eric Hargan. Mr. Secretary, how are you? Uh, doing great, Matt. How are you this morning? I'm doing great. So the first thing is we know that you've got a very serious job. The Department of HHS uh, is like the largest department in our government. And uh, you've got a lot of things to manage and operate. Are you at HHS at this moment? Yep, I'm, I'm here at HHS, uh, as I am every day uh, for the past weeks uh, as we continue to try to respond to this uh, coronavirus outbreak. Uh, so, yep, it's, it's all hands on deck, either through telework or, in my case, uh, physically here. Uh, I and uh, everybody in the kind of immediate office of the secretary have to be here. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, the first question is, you've had a lot of different uh, positions, really senior positions in previous Republican administrations. You've been at HHS before. Um, one of the stories I don't think that gets told is under the previous Republican administration, the administration of George W. Bush, uh, your team, that president, actually put into place many steps to prepare the country for a pandemic outbreak and to make yep. sure we had stockpiles and were responsible. Can you give our, our, our viewers an idea of what President uh, Bush and his administration did and what President Obama uh, and the, and the uh, Obama-Biden administration actually didn't do to prepare us? Well, you know, what we did then was, you may remember there was an outbreak of avian flu that took place uh, under the Bush administration. And what was done in response to a lot of the things there and in the wake of 9-11 uh, earlier was that we started a preparedness and response agency called ASPR, Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. And that's been the foundation of what we've done so far. So really it's been 15, 20 years of building a foundation under Secretary Thompson, Secretary Levitt and President Bush to start off with. Uh, we had the pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act was passed that set up this the uh, BARDA, which is our uh, biodefense research and development agency here at HHS that's developed a lot of products. Uh, and we also have the strategic national stockpile now uh, that we all know about that helps uh, procure all kinds of things for the country, serves as a backup for the states and localities so that they have a lot of the, uh, a lot of the items that they need to respond. So a lot of those things dealing with guidance, helping states and localities interact. And you know, I can see for myself, having been there under President Bush, uh, what an advance has been made uh, by building on the foundations that were laid back then under President Bush. So, um, But did so you have the really uh, did President Trump had the benefit of inheriting all these stockpiles or had they mostly been depleted through the you know, various outbreaks in the Obama years? Well, there had been the now famous or infamous N95 respirators had, had been run down uh, under the 
previous administration from what had been given to them under President Bush. Um, I'm sure if they could go back in time, they would probably fill those back up. Uh, but that just that just wasn't the case. They they obviously put their efforts elsewhere and in, in replenishing the stockpile or or buying other items. But those weren't there, and of course that turned out to be uh, an issue. Yeah, I mean you have to give President Bush and the team he put around him some credit for saying, look. Uh, it's too late when the pandemic hits to start thinking about these things. And because he thought about them, him and his Republican administration, they were able to kind of prepare the country. And yep. uh, it's yep. it's important Absolutely. to correct that record because there's so much coverage about the Trump administration kind of doing the opposite of what actually happened. Yeah, it was building on something. We had an influenza response plan. We had all kinds of things that where the foundations were laid, updated over the years, but really the foundations for dealing with a pandemic uh, we were building on something that we had thought about, uh, had encountered, and were uh, putting in place things that, if they hadn't been there, this would have been a, a huge problem for the country right now. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, you know, we're all looking at the economy. Some of some parts of the economy are going full tilt. For instance, you know, all these internet platform companies—they're going full tilt as we're all on our, you know, teleconferences and web conference calls and everything else. You know, you have all the big box retailers that are going full tilt. Parts of our economy are going full tilt without uh, tremendous jeopardy to people's health. You, you, one of your jobs and Alex Azar's job, the secretary of HHS, is to advise the president as he looks to working with governors to get the rest of the economy opened up in a safe and responsible way. Can we get that done in a way that can alleviate people's concerns mostly? Well, you know, it does. Uh come down to a lot of questions of whether or not uh, people have confidence to go back to work uh, and we have confidence on the part of state and local leaders. Uh, the response here, as you've seen, is really uh, in the hands of state and local leaders. In many cases, they've been the ones who've imposed these business and social activity lockdowns. That's, that's kind of what you do in situations like this. You have local leaders and state leaders who take the uh, who take the lead? We help facilitate. We prepare guidelines for them. We give them best practices here at HHS. You know, we have medical and scientific experts, uh, national experts who can help advise on those kinds of things. We also have, you know, through the FDA, we've been working to approve dozens of tests and new therapeutics and working on vaccines and new therapeutics, getting those through the pipeline uh, because you know private industry has stepped up really magnificently uh, in this circumstance to bring forward all kinds of new ideas and ways of solving problems that uh, we've seen multiply daily, frankly, uh, coming in. And you know we have worked, I, I think, in an an unprecedented way. I think it's something that isn't that we're going to be talking about for years to come. Uh, it's confronted with a crisis. This administration, under the president's leadership, and and has really adopted a deregulatory attitude to help unleash our free enterprise system in the country to respond. Both the ingenuity and the productive capacity of our private sector has been key uh, to being able to address this crisis. And then also, instead of centralizing power, we really emphasize the decentralization to be able to empower right. local and local and state leaders to respond on, on, the, on the spot to situations in their own communities. It sounds like what you're saying, Mr. Secretary, is this a, this is a 10th Amendment moment where uh, lo local officials, state officials are going to have a big role in how we get the rest of this economy opened up. Yet at the same time, you can assure all of our listeners that if you have a concern, a health concern, or Alex Azar has a health concern with uh, the way the economy is being opened up. I mean, of course, you're going to tell the president, right? Oh, of course. I mean, that's that's our job, and we have, you know, the data surveillance system, and we have a lot of the information uh, through CDC and others of our agencies to be able to monitor those things and really inform the situation on the ground for um, both from the president's point of view. Uh, obviously, because, you know, we're here in the federal government and he's our leader, uh, but also to the state and local leaders that we're interacting with all the time uh, to help bring our own resources, whether it's information or advice to them. And, and so it's been very well coordinated uh, so far. And, and again, yeah. looking, hearkening back to those foundations that were laid uh, and those communications that we've had all along with them. Well, I think I, I do want to 
say I should have started off this way. I have great admiration for what everybody's doing at HHS and you know more widely in the administration. I know we know you're working constantly all the time. You have the nation's best interests at heart, uh, and you have a special kind of role in all this because I understand you speak a bit of Chinese, and right. uh, you've been to China a whole bunch of times. Right. Uh, you're not a, a lover of uh, the communist way in China, but you have an insight into what their plans are. Can you give our viewers an idea when it comes to these health questions of where drugs are made and everything else, what's what's the communist government, what is she, what is their plan uh, on these types of questions? Well, I think, you know, what's important in this is partially trying to understand what happened with regard to them giving us data well, you know, we had been asking for uh, for us or on behalf of international partners to get scientists in there, and China only allowed those weeks and weeks into this uh, into this outbreak. And we obviously were, and everyone was reacting to the data that they gave us, which turned out to be in many cases just not accurate uh, with regard to how how and when this outbreak happened. And that's been. Uh, an issue that we are going to have to confront. In addition, obviously, the question of where, is our, where are our medical supplies coming from? Um, now, one thing to know is that we've been here before. Uh, in 2004, we lost half of our flu vaccine that year, and we had moved to try to bring on shore some of our capacity. And some right. of those efforts have been successful, but it's clear that there is a, a much larger question that needs to be addressed in this country uh, that about exactly where we're getting uh, what, we're, what we need in terms of our medical supplies, how we can access them, and the question about where should they be produced? Because ultimately, that's that's come down to be a very difficult question for us to to have. When we need it, we're going to need those medical supplies in the future. Uh, it's a question that again was addressed before uh, in some ways, but now it's a much broader issue, and I think it's been brought to the fore. And I think the American people, as well as we in the federal government, understand that uh, it's a question we're going to have to confront in short order when we get on the downside right. for this crisis. Yeah. You know, the other thing that our uh, viewers should know is that you are a principled conservative. You're somebody I've known over the years, Dan Schneider, our executive director as well. And so uh, you have a healthy respect for freedom and the individual and the idea of free markets and free trade, but it's got to be balanced on these questions about health and life and the very existence of a country with the ability to, for America to take care of Americans we get into these kinds of uh, emergencies. Well, you know, it's it's sometimes it's very natural for a country to say, you know, if they're concerned about the outbreak of a of a pandemic, that pandemic is global and it affects everyone pretty much at the same time. Although right. we did have success in slowing the entrance of the disease into the United States because of the president's very swift action in closing down most travel from China early on, that closing down those flights from China uh, has been acknowledged right. to be, uh, in retrospect, a decision that just uh, keeps uh, kind of helping us along in terms of delaying the entrance of the disease into the United States. That is a, that's a big question. Many countries will say, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to allow uh, supplies out. They, they might move to uh, cut those supplies or those shipments out of their own country. That's a question that we're going to have to confront. That means that when we need it, we're going to need it for our patients and those who are sick in the United States. So I think that's going to, there's a conversation that's already started. I think it's going to continue and only get uh, stronger as the, as the days and weeks go on. Uh, one of the crisis comes to a conclusion, God willing. Mr. Secretary, I don't mean to interrupt you, but one of the great things about this show is we're talking to our CPAC family and we have a question uh, from one of our great CPAC uh, fans and family members, uh, Grizzly Joe. Grizzly Joe, give us your question. Hello, CPAC Live. Grizzly Joe here in the Northeast. Mr. Secretary, Presumably, we'll get to a point down the road where everyone who wants to be tested for coronavirus antibodies can get the test regardless of symptoms. Do we know if the mere presence of coronavirus antibodies will negate the necessity of a subsequent vaccination when that hopefully is developed? Thank you, sir. 
Um, well, the issue about long-term immunity uh, by the presence of antibodies is a, a big question that we're only going to know in the long term, kind of by its nature. Uh, because it's a new virus, we've only had been able to study it and the, the immune effects of antibodies for a short period of time. It's only been an outbreak for, say, four or five months. So that's going to be a question that I think every day we're going to get a firmer and firmer answer on. I think the question about it is we get better tests, uh, more tests and, and better tests, and get the productive capacity again of the private sector engaged to be able to do broader kind of public health surveillance on the presence of antibodies, we're going to get a better and better understanding of the immune nature of the antibodies. You know, you can see it in your own life. You know, when somebody has gets a vaccine, sometimes you need a booster, sometimes you don't. Uh, the diseases vary, the immune reaction varies, the long-term immunity varies, uh, disease to disease. So we're going to have a better idea as we go forward. It's always better to have more data about these things uh, and to see and to get a better idea. People are going to be making decisions based on this uh, one way or another. But I think the science of it is going to be following because, as I say, the, the long-term immunity effects of the antibodies is only we're only going to know it in the long term just by its nature. Well, this conversation, I'm sure, is giving everybody even more confidence in the team that the president has pulled together. I think it's interesting, Secretary Hargan, when the president says he's ultimately in charge, that is akin to what Harry S. Truman said when the he said the buck stops here and the on the desk in the Oval Office. And some naysayers in the media say that that's uh, the president uh, you know, being egotistical. I love hearing the fact that he understands he's got to make the decision, but when he has people around him like you, uh, it, it's a great confidence booster. And we want to thank you for being with us and for being at CPAC. And we're going to be joined by Vince Colonnais. We're going to have a conversation about uh, what you all are doing, the important decisions you're making in the Trump administration. But first, we want to show this clip of Eric Hargan at CPAC. This, these are, and there's, there are more cases coming into the United States at this point. Uh, we, this is something we've anticipated, uh, and I want everybody to be clear that we have the best public health system in the world. We have great professionals working on this, um, and frankly, the early aggressive response that was taken under the president's leadership to uh, ban travel by non-citizens from China to the United States bought us precious days and weeks to prepare for this. It's Matt Schlapp back with our great friend, Vince Colonnais. Vince, uh, I'm gonna say you run The Daily Caller uh, uh, and you have this great show on every morning in the swamp, uh, mornings on the mall. I almost said mornings with Maria because I love Maria Bartiromo so much, she's but she's like, she's like a television competitor kind of because she's on yeah. like you're on. But it's a great show because you get all the greatest guests uh, in politics because you're in D.C. And uh, I always love talking politics uh, with you. You speak at CPAC every year, as you did this year. Uh, you got a chance, uh, Vince, to listen to Secretary Hargan. Um, what's your reaction? Uh, it's interesting on a number of fronts, but I want to start at, towards the beginning when he was talking about the Bush administration getting uh, sort of preparing the stockpile for a pandemic, preparing all of the resources of the federal government for the potential of a pandemic. Uh, and, you know, there, I, there was a mixture of outcomes from that, of course, because by the time we get to the Obama years, the public reporting is really clear on this. They just fell asleep at the switch when it came to actually stocking the things that we would need for a pandemic that would run rampant and require especially uh, ventilators. Now, at this moment, by I think a combination of good tactics and an act of God, we were lucky in that the federal resources that we did have available, which again, were very limited, were a little bit overprepared, right? You saw that the president sent a ton of ventilators to New York that didn't need to be used in the end. And that is that comes as a great relief. But I think it's the kind of thing that makes you nervous enough that you say, that just cannot happen again. And you really do have to look back to the Obama administration and say, they really failed, and, and you've got to have a government that's well-prepared. And I think now, in the midst of tackling a pandemic, the Trump administration has about as clear of a warning as ever to get ready for the next one, especially if it's going to be bigger. Well, I think uh, Secretary Hargan was polite in his accurate description that Obama left the nation unsafe in terms of being prepared for a pandemic. So just to put a finer point on what you just said, President Bush reads a book about uh, viruses that can go global, 
and kind of have an outbreak. And he says, we better prepare for this. And he spends something like seven, eight billion dollars uh, creating new offices at HHS and in the National Security Council. They have all these stockpiles. They have experts. They're ready. And uh, what happens when uh, we have an outbreak? I believe it was swine flu in the beginning of the uh, uh, Obama administration. They went through all the stockpiles and uh, they replenished some, but they went through a lot of those billions of dollars of supplies. And Obama, you know, H1N1, I believe, really hit kids. And literally, right after declaring an emergency on H1N1, he had something like 2,000 kids over to the White House for a Halloween party. I mean, yeah. And there was no critical news coverage of that, you know. Yeah, I think the thing that stuck out to me the most was the fact that uh, Secretary Hargan just said it was the N95 respirators that were com like completely right. depleted and not restocked. And I just got to say, how many times have we had the conversation that like, oh, Obama, he's the cerebral one. He's the science guy. He's the guy who like cares about the future and cares about preparing right. for these big natural disasters, the climate, all of this. Now he owns a home in like a flood zone of Martha's Vineyard and didn't restock the N95 respirators. Let's be honest about what actually happened. Uh, I think you're inaccurate. You need to get your story straight. I think he might have three homes like that. Yeah, I don't know. Story. I don't know if it's just one. <laughs> I forgot that. Oh, by the way, welcome to my home. I wanted to show you. Here's my resting Tucker face mug. That's, <laughs> That's awesome. That. Yeah. 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 Like uh, you have a little bit of, uh, you know, Tucker Carlson uh, helped establish the Daily Caller. And uh, am I right, yeah. Vince? And yeah, exactly. uh, yeah. Neil Patel and other great people, uh, uh, you guys have a, you really, you've got a product you should be proud of and you're doing good work. Uh, how do you manage getting all these things done in a day? Thank you. Uh, and that's a real credit to the incredible reporters at The Daily Caller. Look, I, at, at the time, you think back to when they founded this. That was 2010 when they got The Daily Caller kicked off. And uh, the big... Uh, opening in the market, as it were, that Neil uh, Patel and Tucker Carlson saw at the time was that uh, the right, especially conservative conservative audiences, especially needed actual news reporting. Yes. So that was the plan. Start, start a news outlet and focus on news reporting. A lot of people have opinions out there, but more fact gathering needs to be done. So that's the mission of the site. And uh, I'm just so proud to have even been any part of it uh, through this last decade and, uh, and hopefully for many more years to come. So it's, it's a blast. The day of the caller, you know, I can tell you it's a it's a go to place for so many of us to check and see what's happening, including some local coverage, which is good, too. But the uh, who's who are your crack reporters? You say you're doing real reporting, Vince, which I know is to be true, but I know you're going to have to play favorites here. But who's really doing a good job? It's this is one of the benefits of being a successful site <laughs> is that I've got so many people to go through. Uh, but I'll just focus real quickly on, you know, Christian Daytalk does the White House for right. us. He's doing an incredible job. Henry Rogers just called every United States senator who's a Democrat to ask them about their feelings on Tara Reid the other day. Uh, I love Henry weirdly, Rogers. Yeah, he's great. And weirdly, none of them responded. So that was a yeah. story. Uh, additionally, we've got Peter Hassan and Chuck Ross, who are yes. among the most aggressive investigative reporters. And where does Chuck Ross live? This is very important for people to know. Is this, I, I guess I can disclose it, but he lives in Kansas. Which is where I'm from, Vince. So this is yeah. why this is very important to me. I think I retweet more of Chuck Ross than I do anyone. He does a great Yeah, job. if you ever run for Senate, the one guy you got to suck up to is Chuck Ross. That's oh, the he guy. he killed me. He could positively kill me. That's exactly right. So <laughs> it's just, and there's so many other great reporters who work there. And um, it's just, honest, honestly, the thing, the one quality that Tucker and Neil were hiring for is the type of aggression where people just lead with their chin. You know, the kind of people who just like drink head first at the, at the uh, well. well uh, I, that's what these guys do all the time. I have to give Tucker a lot of credit on his show the other day. He was bringing up this really disgusting scandal that uh, this big consulting firm, McKinsey, has been consulting with the communists in China and literally colluding with the communists in China to get more man American man manufacturing to move to China. Unbelievable. Uh, it's the kind of stories that uh, we really need to hear behind all this. And another story that people uh, this morning woke up to is this uh, Joe Biden going on uh, uh, MSNBC and talking about this Tara Reid, uh, you know, allegation of sexual of a sexual attack um uh what's your reaction to how he did and how it's being covered well i uh i got out of my radio show this morning i did see some of the coverage uh as it was occurring and uh typically those raw reactions are good to measure because by the time people get to filter them too much they spin them uh and the the raw reactions were that biden did not do well that it was an abysmal performance on his part i spoke to uh, a, a mutual friend of ours brett Baer, today 
um, and on my radio show, and I asked him, you know, what did you think? And he said, right out the gate, Biden was strong in the sense that he merely just denounced the allegation. But after that, it fell apart. And Brett's right. And the reason for that is because Mika Brzezinski, of all people on MSNBC, is there with him. I think the expectations were so low for Morning Joe that um, they almost felt like it was a threat to their ego because everyone was saying this is going to be a cakewalk. They're going to give him kid gloves. Everyone knows it. So I think that they felt a bit of insecurity about that, uh, that accusation. And boy, Mika came in swinging. And when she did, she said to Joe, very simply, he, Joe Biden claimed, look, I want the Senate archives to release any records related to this woman. I'm totally OK with that. And she said, OK, but what about your other records that are at the University of Delaware? And he, he insisted, no, 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 those have nothing to do with personnel. She's like, no, OK, wait a second. The woman who's accusing you says the records in question may very well be at the University of Delaware. So how about this? Instead of releasing all of the records, how about you just release the records that include the name Tara Reid? How about you just do a search for that? And boy, I tell you, Matt, Joe Biden not having an answer to that, he had no to answer. dodge that, is it makes him look so much worse. And I would not want to I be agree. on his campaign today watching that. Well, the thing I, uh, if any of you were following me on Twitter, I actually got up at 6.30 this morning and I stumbled across the fact that Joe Biden was going to be on Morning Joe as I was watching the various morning shows, which I almost have to put something in my coffee some mornings to get through it. But the, but I didn't. And uh, I watched all the pre-coverage and the coverage, and I, I, I sent a lot of tweets this morning on it. And I think there's a couple things that are really important for people on your beat, Vince, to remember. I came in as a staffer in 1995. So did Dan Schneider, our executive director. He came in a few years later. But you know, email was kind of like a new thing, believe it or not, back then. Like email in office, you still did a lot the old-fashioned way. You didn't really use email for everything. And we couldn't even communicate with our district offices because it was so slow, the old dial-up stuff. So the idea that there will be a lot of emails about this, uh, we have to remember going back in time, they won't exist. The second thing that's critical is when Joe Biden says, I want all the documents to be released from the National Archives. Remember, Congress has exempted itself from nearly every requirement to hold on to documents. The executive branch, you can FOIA almost everything that happens. And there's always some kind of scandals in White Houses about what they kept or didn't kept, a la Hillary Clinton ble bleach be uh, bedding her email uh, servers yes. so that we couldn't look at the information that we have a legal requirement to look at. Congress exempts itself from almost all of that stuff. So when he says release documents, they're actually, it was probably would have been legal for Senator Joe Biden and his staff to get rid of a bunch of documents because there's just not that same mentality totally. because they want to cover up their scandals in a bipartisan way on the Hill. And it's the latest manifestation, as you were pointing out, of the inside game in Washington. That's that right. Especially a guy like Joe Biden. He's so high powered. He's so high profile. It he's was fake to transparency. All right fake. It's all fake. Yeah, he's connected to all the right people to make this thing go away. You wonder why the women's groups didn't spend the last week attacking Joe Biden? The answer to that is the woman who serves as his senior advisor, Anita Dunn, worked for Barack Obama and now runs the most powerful Democratic publicist firm in the city, SDK Knickerbocker. And as a result, she is also the publicist for every one of those women's groups. Huh. Weird coincidence. And remember, Back 27 years ago, every time Joe Biden says 27 years ago, it's a disastrously stupid yeah. way to describe this because a bad thing, even if it happens a long time ago, is a bad thing. But 27 years ago, the Senate was Ted Kennedy's playground and the White House was Bill Clinton's internship training program. That was a very, very different time in Washington. And the idea that somehow just because this happened 27 years ago gives us all confidence that a young female staffer would have the ability to have her grievance listened to, I think you'd, I think that's hard to hard to believe. Look, I'll just I'll just react to this with the one thing I think that's always worth remembering. Who know I don't know if Tara Reed uh, is making an accusation that is true. I don't know that. But the I think what's on display here is a transparently hypocritical treatment of a woman's allegation against a Democrat. When right. if you know for a fact that if Brett Kavanaugh had countless photos of himself That's grabbing right. women who were trying to pull back from his unsolicited grasp right. the way we have of Joe Biden, right. Brett Kavanaugh would not be a Supreme Court justice today if those types of photos. Existed. And why do they why do they look the other way with Joe Biden? Because a Joe Biden presidency 
means abortion on demand through all nine months of pregnancy. That is their kind of wicked sacrament, and he's going to put people on the court that will not uphold the Constitution, but that will have this radical agenda. And with that,